You may remember that I featured this, the Planet Computers Gemini, in Phone Show 332 about four months ago. Now that was a late prototype and it only had an hour with it, and my thoughts were very much a preview of the Gemini's reason for existing. I've now had a retail Gemini for a few weeks. In fact, I've had two here for a bit, one from the first batch of a thousand and one up in the 4000 region. I only mention this because the first units off the production line had a softer keyboard feel that many people found too wobbly. The newer unit was much better, not as firm as the original Scion, but still solid enough to bash away at 50 words a minute, also with practice. As it turns out, there's a DIY fix for those softer keyboards on the first thousand Gemini's made, and I was fascinated to see an expert fitting a new key map before my eyes. It took him 30 minutes. It'll probably take you or I an hour, but it does largely fix the feel issues some early adopters have talked about. Having established in my first look that the Gemini stood for productivity, I absolutely stand by this. Having a pocket computer with landscape display and proper keyboard puts you in a very different frame of mind than when staring at a portrait glass slab. So you'll gravitate towards note taking, email, uh, sorting out your finances, web browsing and so on. The Gemini can play games, but not all of them. The odd screen orientation confuses some titles and it can deliver media. So YouTube, Netflix, Prime Video and so on with the propped up six inch display obviating the need for a stand of some kind. But the stereo speakers have limited fidelity. <laughs> this really doesn't seem the Gemini's strong suit. Media generally is a little underwhelming on this unashamedly non-consumer handset. Music benefits from a 3.5mm jack and a very loud DAC, but you can tell that corners have been cut. In terms of shielded electronics, between songs, the amount of electrical noise down the line is horrifying. Also not the Gemini's strength is imaging. Out of the box, there's no external camera like this, so you're left to use the 5 megapixel internal camera. Happily, the main use you'll have on such a productivity-centric device is for video calls, and the Gemini excels at Hangouts, Skype, WhatsApp, and other video calling solutions, again helped by the natural angle of the display. There's also this optional 5 megapixel rear stroke top camera. Now, this comes as part of an assembly which replaces the default plain metal screen back. It's easy to fit in a couple of minutes or so if you haven't lost the special pry tool to get the cover off in the first place. At 5 megapixels and f over 2.8, it's not worthy of special mention, except to say that results can be well, quite good and good light about what you'd expect. And 1080p video, though not as electronically stabilised as the settings would have you believe. At least not yet. Updates incoming. You do get picture and picture effects, though. A nice touch. Who would use such a camera? Well, I guess if you're a compulsive shutterbug, I want to grab scenes before you as memories without minding too much about absolute quality. The alternative is to hold the Gemini keyboard and screen first towards the subject. There's my S9 Plus shooting this. And then you can't see to press the shutter icon properly. In fact, having used the Gemini with and without the optional camera, I say go for it every time. Even if it's that one memory, that one snap per week that needs a proper rear camera, then it's worth the small, small bump on the back of the device. It's possible that potential users will be happy with just a front-facing camera for selfies and video calls, but I think they'd be missing out. Come on, even in video calls, don't you switch cameras sometimes to show the caller what you're seeing? There are USB Type-C ports either side, but things aren't quite as they seem. Both work fine for data and mounting peripherals, hubs, memory sticks, even Type-C DACs and dongles, but only the left port has the wiring for charging, which is fair enough once you know the trick. Having a decent keyboard always present is incredibly freeing. The number of times a day that I'd get frustrated on a regular smartphone that the keyboard just halved my available screen real estate. Not an issue here. The number of times a day when I break out a Bluetooth keyboard or reach for my laptop because I can't face hammering or swiping out what needs to be typed on a virtual keyboard. Here the keyboard is always present, always integrated. It's the biggest USP on a smartphone that I've seen, I think, in a very long time. As I mentioned before, it's not about raw typing speed. Virtual keyboards are often faster than typing on this real keyboard, allowing for the auto-correction that gets done. But that's not the point. The Gemini is about a can-do attitude. Whatever life throws at you, open the Gemini up. You have the tools to do the job. A crashed server at work, a report that needs tweaking for the boss, writing your novel in bursts while travelling a lot. This is perfect. So yes, the Gemini has the guts of a modern Android smartphone, a DecaCore MediaTek X27 processor with 4GB of RAM. 
64 gigabyte storage plus micro SD expansion, they do have to turn the phone off and pop off the top to access the slot and to change the micro SIM card. Both fair enough, though the latter will need an adapter if you have a modern nano SIM. Wi-Fi goes to AC and a 4,200 milliamp hour battery. That is, well, where? Where have they put it? <laughs> There's some serious TARDIS magic here, I tell you. Real world battery life is no more than a day though, partly through inefficiencies in the MediaTek chipset, I suspect, but also partly that the 18 by nine, six inch 1080p display here only really looks its best at maximum brightness, maximum all the time. So that burns through power. The clamshell form factor is chunky at 1.3 centimeters thick, but it doesn't really need a case. So there's a saving there at least. The two halves are hinged together, but with the hinge and gap, plus the all important ribbon cables, which don't get bent too severely in this design, protected at the back by a flexible steel cover. This folds down smartly in order to also prop up the Gemini on a flat surface for an angled typing experience. And with the contact point then another centimeter further back than the closed device would have suggested, meaning that when you tap the display to do something, the device doesn't tip over. The keyboard itself is mechanical and with decent key travel. Each key is suspended on a column of silicone above a micro switch, which means that there's side to side wobble under the fingers. This isn't really a showstopper, in my opinion. The only real issue is the space spot. A two inch wide key with only one switch means that despite the wire supports, hitting the ends of the bar don't work. You need to bash it somewhere in the middle. <laughs> you learn to do this quickly. Planet Computers has gone with a very stock build of Android, meaning that updates should be quick and relatively timely. Within a few months of Google, though it's too early to see the track record here, obviously. The main additions are the Planet Computers customizable shortcut bar, which can be popped up at any point in the interface, mimicking the original Scion palm tops, of course, switching to your most commonly used applications. Plus notes, a tabbed note taker with embedded images and recordings if needed. Though there's no export function yet, you have to share via traditional Android means. Function hotkeys control many Gemini functions. So you get key shortcuts for settings, taking a screenshot, media playback controls, microphone muting, recent apps volume, brightness adjustment, emojis, Google Assistant, plus every punctuation symbol you'll ever need. Handy having so many keys, eh? What you don't get are NFC or biometrics. Of all the differences here from a modern Android flagship, the lack of these two, especially a fingerprint scanner, might be the biggest showstopper for someone looking to use this as their only device. Where might such a scanner be? Well, maybe in the space bar, like on the Blackberries, maybe in the Google Assistant button on the side, both would work. The Gemini closes like an old spectacles case with a satisfying snap and with magnets holding it closed against the sprung pressure of all the keys being compressed. It's really quite clever. It's a system that works well. With the steel exterior panels and the screen tucked away, you take phone calls on the Gemini using a system of LEDs and the multifunction button on the right edge. Essentially, the LEDs flash and animate. This means the wife's calling. Uh, she can wait. <laughs> Sorry, dear. According to your assignments in the supplied Ledison utility. Uh, pressing the button picks up the call, obviously, and you know what? It works brilliantly. Thankfully, you can get quite creative. Night Rider, anyone? <laughs> It doesn't ma matter which way up you take a call. There are speakers and microphones at both ends. You just uh, pick it up and talk and the device works it out. Obviously for notifications, anything else, you open up the Gemini and deal with them properly using the full screen and the keyboard. In theory, the multi-function button is also a quick way to talk to Google Assistant when the device is closed. So you don't always have to open it right up. How tall is Big Ben? I'm Fortunately, there's a glitch in the current software, so you have to open it up to hear the answer. 96 metres. Which rather foils the point. It's mirrored by function space when the Gemini is open to save you fumbling on the side. It'll be fixed in an update. There are options to configure the Gemini to dual boot into various Linux distros or even Sailfish OS, but that blows out the over-the-air updates, isn't really recommended for most users and is a very geeky story for another day. Also geeky and trivial to implement is fiddling with the DP setting and developer options, giving you far more information on screen at the expense of readability. You can even route the device and ditch the navigation bar. <laughs> do both and with good eyesight, you've got a miniature Android laptop that can do anything and go anywhere with you. So I have to ask, just how geeky do you want to be with this? 
Now that the original Indiegogo campaign is over and virtually all Geminis have been shipped back as the unit is on sale for £600, including VAT in the UK, which is pricey, but then this is rather specialist and for what it does, it has very little competition. The closest might be the new BlackBerry Key 2, which will be in the next phone show, but that's not really the same. There's a lot here that shows promise for the future. I've no idea how a Gemini 2 might be financed or sold. I'd love to see enough people buy the original that a successor becomes viable. Personally, I'd like to see a wider AMOLED screen, NFC, better spacebar with integral fingerprint sensor, backlit keys, better optional camera, better quality control all around. All of this is, I think, doable, and I'd pay an extra £100 for the privilege. In the meantime, if you, like me, felt your heart skip a beat when the Gemini unfolds and you see what's inside, ready for action, then however many caveats I just went through, this might just be the productivity booster you've been waiting for. It's certainly the geekiest fun you'll have in 2018.